Hello everybody, my name is Mark Callahan and I'm going to be presenting on Picasso's rose and blue period paintings on the early 20th century. Before I go any further today, it's important to tell you that at the end of the presentation there'll be ample opportunity to post questions and hopefully we'll have a discussion as well about many of the great artworks we'll be looking at today. So please bear that in mind, lots of Q&A opportunities at the end. As we go along looking at these artworks, I'm also going to be posing questions to you. They're going to hang in the air as we scrutinise many of these great paintings. They'll hopefully prompt ideas and questions that you might want to ask at the end as well. So please bear that in mind. And the object today is to look at the origins of Picasso's success, this most celebrated artist. Where did it all begin for him? So we're looking at the years 1901 to 1906. And this is the reason, the origins, for him becoming one of the most celebrated artists of the modern era. To some extent, his career is overshadowed by those great Cubist works of the teens, 20s and 30s which followed. But what I want to focus on is what happened before that. We'll see that the blue and rose periods show an emerging talent who is also very conscious of just how talented he is as well. He, his paintings of this era record the delinquents living in Paris a century ago. They follow an interest in the Impressionists, but are also determined to break away from that style as well. And we'll also see that many of these paintings are actually quite autobiographical. Now, if I was to say the name Picasso to you, I wonder what would come to mind. For most people, two paintings are often referred to, and they're not of the blue and period, blue and rose period era. So the paintings in question tend to be these two. These are his two arguably most famous works in a career that spanned nearly 90 years. Top here we see La Demoiselle d'Avignon, painted in 1907. So this is just after the blue and rose period works come to an end. Quite a transformation in style is something you'll notice there. And it's actually the origins of Cubism. At the bottom here we see Guernica, another very famous work by Picasso, painted in 1937. And these two works have in many ways become so famous that what came before it have been a little bit marginalised. Well I'm going to correct that today because what I would contend is that if Picasso passed away before he had the opportunity to paint these works, we would still be talking about him today mainly because the blue and rose period paintings are so good, they're so valuable, very important to art history. Picasso had, it's fair to say, a very varied career. This is just a snapshot of his career from beginning to end. His very first self-portrait that you see here from the blue period, right down to his very last self-portrait in 1972. I love what happened between those two bookends, a remarkable transformation in style. It's like the Beatles going from Hard Day's Night in 1964 to Sergeant Pepper at the end of 66. Almost a completely different band. And I would say that this looks like there's probably 10 different artists on this one screen, yet actually it's just one man. A remarkable artist indeed. You won't find many detractors of Picasso. It'd be hard pushed to find people who are very critical of him. I did find one though, and that's Jermaine Greer, very outspoken of course, and she said of Picasso, there is nothing more to most of Picasso's work than virtuistic showing off. Basking in his own brilliance, it's all about him. As we go through these works today, I'd be interested to know what you think of that at the end. Is it really all about him, or is there something else happening as well? It's certainly fair to say that Picasso had an ego. I'll give you a few moments to read these quotes on screen. Now it's worth bearing in mind that Picasso said these things after he became an established artist. 
but when he moved to Paris from Barcelona in late 1900, he wasn't established. He was an unknown artist, yet he was still very confident and very self-assured in what his abilities were and where his future was heading. This is actually the first work that he produced in Paris and it's attributed to being the very first Blue Period work. Let's take a very close look at what's happening here. First of all, the title, Yo Picasso. Now, Yo is not street slang. It's actually Spanish for I. I, Picasso. Now, that is a remarkable statement for this unknown 19-year-old to be making. I, Picasso. Here I am. I've arrived in Paris. It's possible to see signs of Picasso's identification with the figure of both the romantic genius and the bohemian artist in this one self-portrait. He depicts himself in the artist's studio, late at night, lit by candles. Light was a common metaphor for artistic inspiration, and painting late into the night, this meant that you were someone who was suddenly overcome by this great idea, and you had to rush to your studio to paint something, even though it was 3 a.m. And that's what Picasso is putting across here by painting himself at night in his studio. Notice his bright white smock with this smear of yellow on the sleeve here. This is of course paint and it's a costume commonly worn by a young bohemian artist at the time. So why is he depicting himself in this way? Picasso is telling us not necessarily who he is but what he would like to think of himself as being. So he's portraying himself as the young bohemian artist who belongs in Paris, even though he's an unknown. It was also the first of Picasso's works to be signed, which is another sign of trying to establish himself and maybe his ego at work a little bit too. It's difficult to pick out, but it's actually just here at the top, Yo Picasso. Before I go any further, it's important to tell you that Picasso would not like what we're doing now. He would not approve of what I'm doing by analysing his work and he would not approve of what you're doing by trying to study what's happening in his work as well. Not like that at all. If he was sitting here on the front row, he would probably be quite a troublesome passenger. He didn't like analysts, he didn't like art historians at all. I'll just give you a moment to read this. Now there is a famous story about Picasso later in his life when he was a long established, very famous artist and two German art history students approached him and they said, Monsieur Picasso, please give us your insights into your great paintings. We'd really like to know what this painting means and your interpretation of this one. Picasso stopped walking. He drew a revolver from his coat pocket, fired it into the air. And those two young German art students did exactly what we would have all done. They ran away in fear. Picasso put the revolver back into his coat pocket and just walked home. And that's because he loathed being stopped by people and asked about what his paintings meant. He enjoyed his fame, that's for sure, but he didn't like the analytical art history side at all. And this, of course, means that a lot of our interpretation is not actually led by him at all, which actually is quite a good thing because it allows us the freedom to think about his work without the artist's interruption. Picasso moved to Paris in late 1900. In 1900, Paris was the Belle Epoque, the Exposition Universelle. The Eiffel Tower was a relatively new construction at this time. It had only been there for 11 years. The new railway stations of Gare d'Orsay and Gare de Lyon had been constructed, and also the first metro line. And culturally, the now established and celebrated Impressionists were very much part of the Parisian art history scene. And also, late in 1900, just as Picasso arrived, Oscar Wilde is living out his last days in a poor Parisian hotel. So artistically and culturally, Paris was very much the centre of Europe 
at this time. It was very, very a significant place indeed. Picasso lived here in this ramshackle building known as the Bateau Lavoir because it reminded people of the washboats on the River Seine. He lived the life of a bohemian poor artist. And although he did have some money, he nonetheless enjoyed living that lifestyle. To him, it seemed like, as we saw in the previous portrait, he wanted to become this character, this persona. It was almost the thing that you had to be to be successful. So it's a kind of self-imposed poverty in many ways. So what was Paris like at this time? Just going to give you a flavour of what the circumstances were like, particularly